In my last lecture, I totally indulged in my so-called man crush. So the lecture's title on YouTube, Italian Baroque Painting, was misleading. Caravaggio was not the only Italian Baroque painter. Many of Caravaggio's contemporaries actually preferred Caracci and his over-the-top ceiling paintings that, like the ceiling painting in Il Gesù, used illusionistic techniques. Artemisia Gianaleschi, on the other hand, followed Caravaggio's example with dramatic tenebrism, open compositions, and an unflinching interest in violence. You remember her personal history, right? I find it intriguing that women painters so frequently painted themselves in the act of pursuing their craft. We'll see another couple of examples in this unit and the next. Artemisia Gentileschi fought prejudice against women painters and struggled to get paid for her work. But in the end, she actually achieved a level of acceptance that eluded our bad boy Caravaggio. Grand Duke Cosimo de' Medici became a major patron, and so did King Charles I of England. And speaking of Charles I, this is another old AP favorite that didn't make the list. But I'm going to use it as a segue to the paintings of Flanders and Spain, and more specifically, the works of heavy hitters Peter Paul Rubens and Diego Velazquez. Both were Catholic painters of the Counter-Reformation, but more importantly, at least for interpreting our required works, both were court painters employed to portray and reinforce the authority of Catholic monarchs. Remember, this wasn't just the age of religious wars. The 17th century also witnessed the rise of nation states with absolutist monarchs, who had the motivation and the resources to commission works that celebrated their power and authority. Anthony van Dyck was a Flemish painter who trained under Rubens and followed him into royal service. Charles I was a king of England best known for getting his head chopped off during the English Civil War. On to the first of today's Baroque superstars, Peter Paul Rubens. Rubens was a classically educated humanist scholar and diplomat who was knighted by both Philip IV of Spain and Charles I of England. Although his father was a Calvinist, he was raised a Catholic in Flanders, a Catholic bastion of the Holy Roman Empire. Rubens traveled to Venice as a young man, where he was deeply influenced both by Titian and by Caravaggio. He also studied Greek and Renaissance sculptures, and like so many Baroque artists, was blown away by our old friend Lacone. So here we see Rubens' Baroque Descent from the Cross, which you've already encountered, next to Titian's High Renaissance Entombment, which I didn't include in your group exercise. So what similarities and what differences do you observe? Well, clearly both painters use deep, rich colors and employ light for emphasis. Rubens was also influenced by the way Titian used looser brush strokes to capture the play of light, as you see in the detail of a cloak, on the left and the woman's hair on the right. Another similarity with Titian, they both loved to paint female flesh, although Rubens' nudes tended to have more of it. But note that the composition of the works is quite different. The twisting figures and diagonal lines of Rubens' deposition clearly mark it out as a Baroque work. And here on the right is Caravaggio's entombment. What similarities and differences do you see between these two paintings? Well, these both employ a diagonal composition, but Rubens' colors are brighter and his chiaroscuro is not as sharply defined as Caravaggio's. It doesn't really use tenebrism. The Rubens painting that the College Board chose for the list is not, however, one of his Counter-Reformation religious paintings, but instead one of a series of 24 paintings that Rubens made for a political patron, in this case the former queen and regent of France, Marie de Medici. So let's watch a short video clip from an old but good art history video series. This segment focuses on Rubens' political and religious paintings and gives you a glimpse of still more of the Marie de Medici fan art. So a little more background. Marie de Medici was the wife of Henry IV of France, who himself was one of the most interesting figures of this stormy historical era. A Protestant or Huguenot, Henry fought two other Henrys, it's actually called the War of the Three Henrys, over the right to rule France. He won, but only after promising to convert to Catholicism to persuade Catholic Paris to accept him. Henry IV needed a Catholic wife, and Marie de Medici came well-connected to the Roman hierarchy. You might just recognize that last name. Henry IV was assassinated in 1610, and Marie became regent for her young son, Louis XIII. 
She was not a great ruler. The chaos that Henry IV had suppressed returned, but she fought hard to stay in control of France. Eventually, her son, with the help of his minister Richelieu, banished her from the court. Marie and Louis reconciled a few years later, and she remodeled the luxurious palace of Luxembourg to hold these paintings, which were part of her propaganda effort to regain political influence in France. Uh, it didn't work, by the way. In 1631, Louis XIII banished her again, this time from France and for good, and she died in exile. But Marie de Medici had the money to pay her bills, so Rubens took the job. Still, the cycle presented some real artistic challenges. Marie de Medici wasn't nearly as important as she wanted to portray herself, especially on this many canvases. So Rubens had to stretch to elevator status, and he this, did this mostly by painting the queen hanging out with lots of mythological figures. So in the painting on the left, which has showed up on past AP tests, Marie de Medici is arriving in France from Italy. A personified France kneels before her and below her three sea nymphs from the God of the Seas celebrate her arrival, holding the ship steady so that she can disembark safely. In the felicity of the Regency on the right, Marie is shown in allegorical fashion again as the personification of justice itself, flanked by a retinue of some of the personifications, gods in the Greek and Roman pantheon. Okay, back to our required work. I trust you watched the Khan Academy podcast about this work, since I'm not going to repeat all of their excellent points. There's a little truth underneath all this Gopher Baroque mythological allegory. The king did receive portraits of his future bride. Here you see one portrait of a young Marie de Medici that survived, and looks a little bit like the one in the Rubens painting. But the king was, in fact, not immediately smitten. He was very devoted to his mistress at the time, and he was caught up with the affairs of state. When his advisor announced that the marriage contract had been finalized, Henry apparently exclaimed, You say that I must be married, so it simply must be. Such enthusiasm. But Rubens, who knew it was paying for these portraits, pulls out all the stops. Jupiter and Juno, accompanied by their symbols, the eagle and the peacock, look down benevolently on the couple. The ancient gods of marriage and love, Hymen and Cupid, to the left and right respectively, hover in midair as they present this portrait to Henry IV, the King of France. The flaming torch in Hymen's left hand symbolizes the ardor of his love. The personification of France, we see her again, hovers over the king's shoulder. Yes, your country needs this wife. The painting isn't especially subtle about the benefit that Marie de Medici will bring to the marriage. Henry IV was almost 50 and he needed an heir. Marie did give him six children, which was arguably her biggest political accomplishment. Note that the only figure in the entire work who stares directly at the viewer is Marie de Medici herself in her self-portrait. So the painting draws our initial focus to her. Artists more often, at this time at least, portrayed female figures as objects to be gazed at. Male figures usually held the main focus and power in the work. Okay, confession time. I'm actually not a huge Rubens fan, no man crush. But I really like this painting. It's the one I would have put on the list if they'd made me a member of the College Board ruling junta, which they did not. Rubens was not only a court painter, but he was also a diplomat. He tried unsuccessfully to negotiate peace between Catholic Spain and Protestant England in hopes that England would stop helping the rebellious Dutch. While Rubens' diplomatic efforts did not succeed, he had a front row seat for the horrors of war and a personal stake in bringing them to an end. In this allegorical painting, we see Europe flinging up her arms in despair. We see figures representing the arts being trampled, the fury electo, who's representing the horrors unleashed by war, appears really almost demented. She's on the left. So why would I say that this is vintage Rubens? Well, note the extreme sense of movement, the dramatic and rather light use of color, sometimes described as coloristic, the very full-figured ladies, the use of mythological symbols. Rubens, if you'll pardon a little punning, is ripe for an attribution question. So I need to move on, but let me make one last point about Rubens, and this is something I really could see showing up on your test. Rubens ran his statue as a ver studio, excuse me, as a veritable painting factory. He employed a large workshop of associates. They would do much of the actual painting. 
following the oil sketches and detailed drawings which Rubens provided. He would supervise his assistant's work and make changes where necessary, and he finished off all but the cheapest productions with the touch of his own hand. Rubens considered people his specialty, but he also often turned to others for help with plants and animals. One of his closest friends and collaborators was our old buddy Bruegel. In this painting, Rubens apparently painted Adam, Eve, and the horse, but left most of the plants and animals to Bruegel. They both signed the work. Okay, off to Spain. In geopolitical terms, the 1600s were not kind to Spain. The gold from the New World had brought runaway inflation, and the religious wars depleted Spain's treasury without obliterating Protestantism or even preserving Spanish rule over the Netherlands. Yet these years of decline would bring the greatest flowering of Spanish painting. Philip IV was Philip II's grandson. He was the king who sent the Armada over uh, to try to defeat the English. Philip IV's court painter and among the greatest painters of the Baroque era was Diego Velazquez. Velazquez did the best he could with rather unpromising material. Philip IV had a particularly exaggerated form of the unfortunate Habsburg chin. The painter basically steals her attention away from that unfortunate face by painting the king's elegant clothing in superb detail. So here's a famous work by Velazquez that doesn't portray royalty and of course is not on the list, but whose influence do you see? Well, I warned you about this in my last lecture. The answer to that question so often turns out to be Caravaggio. And what Caravaggio elements can you identify? Well, the central figure looks rather like one of Caravaggio's sensual boys, but we also see the theatrical spotlighting, the pronounced chiaroscuro verging on tenebrism, and the open construction that spills off the canvas. But the tenebrism is less pronounced, a little more like Rubens' modulated chiaroscuro and colorism. And while this is a mythological and not a biblical scene, it seems to me that once again we have the world of the gods dropping down into the lives of ordinary people. On to our required work, and this is one of the most famous paintings in art history, very deserving of a place on the list. Sister Wendy calls it the greatest painting in the story of painting, although we're not going to see that clip. Let's start with your reactions. Why was this painting such a big deal? Where's the light coming from? Look toward the middle of the painting on the right. That's the Prime Minister of Spain and Velazquez's paymaster. He's opening the door to let in the light. Actually, art historians still debate about what's going on in this painting. Are the king and queen watching Velazquez, painting at his own easel, paint their daughter? Is the princess looking at her parents, reflected to us in the mirror, or is she looking at us? And note the shout out to John van Eyck's Arnolfini marriage. So here are a couple of details from the painting. We see Velazquez wearing the mark of nobility that he actually hadn't managed to attain yet, although he will. It was painted on later. And the couple in the mirror are pretty clearly the king and queen. That chin is a giveaway. Are they included to make a more complete family portrait? because they're the subject of the painting, maybe to suggest that Velazquez is almost a member of the royal family, privy to their most intimate moments. While the little princess is clearly the painting's central figure, note how she's bathed in an almost theatrical spotlight. I think it's her dwarf maid of honor who is the emotional center of the painting. Velazquez has imbued her face with enormous dignity, and by the way, he did a number of paintings of court jesters, dwarfs, etc. So this is a woman who has not let deformity defeat her. So what do you notice about brushstrokes? Look especially at the little princess's sleeves. They're broad and easily visible. Remember that art historians use the term loose to describe this kind of brushstroke. The paint is actually laid on quite thickly in a technique you've encountered before. Do you remember the term? impasto, I-M-P-A-S-T-O. So we'll close with another clip from the Art of the Western World. You should recognize the fellow who's going to explain Las Meninas to us, or at least you should recognize his voice. It's our old friend Simon Shama, except he's a lot younger here, and he hasn't, as you'll see, yet learned how to speak to the camera very well. It's kind of cute. I was a lot younger when I first saw this painting, too. In our next lecture, we will continue with Spanish art, but the art of New Spain, or what we now call Latin America.